Greetings history friends. I would like to talk to you a little bit today about the making of the working class, a debate over the Gilded Age, and just inequality and in work in the 19th century in general. To begin, I'm going to open with a story about Bartolomeo Vanzetti, who was an immigrant arriving in New York in the summer of 1908. He had two of the most important things that a new immigrant could have. He had a connection and he had a skill. He was actually a candy maker, by trade, and he had a cousin who was a chief in an exclusive uptown restaurant. He used that cousin to get a job at that restaurant. However, he was put on the sink when he showed up for the job as a dishwasher. The owner only took him in for the summer, so Vanzetti had to look for another gig. He found another job as a dishwasher, working 14-hour days for seven days a week, and that job didn't last long either. Before he knew it, he was out of a job, worried that he would catch tuberculosis in the damp atmosphere, and he had eaten through his savings and found himself wandering the Connecticut countryside, having to beg for scraps from Yankees. Don't believe America is civilized, he wrote. Remove its elegant dress and you find semi-barbarism. So our goal here is to understand the view of how the other half lives. Um, and thinking about last week and this idea of integration that's creating new wealth, we also have to think about this innovation in industrialization is also creating new poverty, right? Investment creates jobs, but these jobs aren't necessarily always paying the best. And capitalism doesn't always mean that everyone is rising on that same wave of wealth. So thinking about labor history in general, let's talk about Marx for just a moment. Marx and Marxism, right, Karl Marx, has this view of history where workers create value. Workers are the majority of the population, and therefore he believes workers should own and control their means of production. Modern historians' views of labor history, they see two things that kind of interplay. One is structure and one is agency. Structure is a systematic side of labor. These are the logical workings of capitalism. It is the requirements of the capitalist system, even though this is over long periods of time and has changed within history. But employers have more power and influence individually and as a group than do individual laborers or merchants. Those are then, from that angle, structural limits imposed on the workers because the, own, the owners will always have more power than the workers. Agency is this idea of choice and ability to act on behalf of the workers. And this is why I've talked and will continue to talk about the workers as agents. Agents that are wanting to work and wanting to have certain rights. This is what historians mean when they talk about the making of a working class or the making of a woman's union. It's an idea of history from the bottom up. Um, it's a history from the viewpoint of the working class. So labor history then is an interplay between these two issues. Labor history and looking at inequality during the Gilded Age, uh, those who achieved great wealth uh, celebrated their fortune in grand style as we hear from John Green. They built magnificent palaces for their homes. Fifth Avenue in New York was known as Millionaire's Row. The wealthy threw lavish parties. One of my favorite accounts of this was this woman named Mrs. Stuvescent Fish who threw a dinner party to honor her dog. And her dog actually arrived to the party sporting a $15,000 diamond collar. If you can imagine that, it would be in the million dollars uh, now, thinking about the turn of the century. However, while the rich lived in this high style, the vast majority were barely able to eke out a living. Corporate wealth bought political power, too. Um, and between 1897 and 1904 alone, $6 billion worth of corporations were organized, which is six times the worth of all incorporations in the previous 18 years. This led to a situation in which the top 4% of companies produced 57% of the industrial output. In 1890, 11 million of the nation's 12 million families earned less than $1,200 per year. Of this group, the average annual income was $380, which is well below the poverty line and the national unemployment rate rose to 17% during the 1890s depression. So when we think about these ideas of security during this time, and thinking back to Vanzetti, the story I opened with, 
there wasn't a lot of job security at this moment. There were jobs available, certainly, but the mechanization was also making these jobs fewer. And if people were just simply able to work 14-hour days, that was another question. Um, and, and more about just working these 14-hour days, work conditions during the late 19th century were wild. By the 1870s, machines were knitting stockings and stitching shirts and dresses, cutting, stitching leather for shoes, and producing nails by the millions. And this reduced labor costs and reduced manufacturing costs, lowered manufacturers' prices, but they also lowered labor costs where workers were getting paid less. So skilled craftspeople of earlier days had the satisfaction of seeing a product from the beginning to the end. This kind of labor was more segmented. You wouldn't necessarily work on the same shoe your whole day. The pace of work usually became faster and faster and was performed in factories that were built to house huge machines. And workers were forced to set very, very long hours. In coal mining particularly, uh, workers often started out as 9- to 10-year-old boys. Their work was so dangerous that they weren't able to purchase life insurance. Between 1870 and 1900, there were about 10,000 men and boys killed in coal mines and around 25,000 injured. And this was an era with no disability compensation. Approximately 35,000 workers a year were killed in work-related accidents from 1888 to 1908. So this is just really dangerous working environments and no ability for an unemployment insurance. Underemployed workers probably counted for about 25% of the workforce. In 1900, this means that 40% of Americans are living below the poverty line. This is physically demanding work, again, with no health benefits. And another part of this is that there's a lot of child employment. In the 1890s, there were about 23,000 children employed across 13 states. And in between 1870 and 1920, there were about one in four non-farm children under 14 who were working full-time. Still in the 1890s, the United States was mostly agrarian, and we'll talk a little bit about poverty and work in rural America when we talk about the populists. But thinking about these workers, we have to also think about the state. The state, as we heard in the last class, usually would side with the employers. The police and military were not called to establish order, but rather to reimpose order against those who were protesting and working class organizations, as we can see with the Haymarket riot, um, which you'll watch videos about too. As I already mentioned, railroads in a previous lecture and the great wealth that was bestowed to the owners of the railroad corporations. In this same vein, I think it's important for us to interrogate the ideas of how, even though these railroad uh, barons were becoming wealthy, the notion of freedom and security for the workers was becoming less attainable. And these are central ideas we'll talk about in the 20th century as well. On one hand, we can argue that private property owners should have the freedom to do what they want with private property, meaning that business owners can hire and fire at will, demand certain hours of work, and pay whatever wages they wish. Of After all, this property was one of Locke's core three natural rights. But on the other hand, when we look to the workers, we consider the issue from the viewpoint of the laborers and other semi-skilled workers. It is their combined efforts that make the corporation possible from this angle. Why is it that some individuals should sit in luxury while they toil in poverty or near poverty? If one person is stuck in this condition and the vast majority were stuck here, surely this means that they aren't living free in society. And if so many people don't consider themselves free to pursue happiness, then this can put the nation's identity and security and very basis at risk. So these are all kind of prime examples and prime grounds to create a social movement as well. Thanks, guys.